Welcome everyone to the Global University Climate Forum. My name is Michelle Brown. I work at the University of Edinburgh as Deputy Director of Social Responsibility and Sustainability and Head of SRS Programs. And I'm the facilitator for today's session. I'm delighted to welcome so many students from around the world to this session on Climate Change Begins at Home. Before we begin, I would like to read the statement of respect, diversity and inclusion, which we wanted to highlight with everyone here. The Global University Climate Forum brings together students to share ideas, learn, connect and act on the global imperative of addressing climate change. The forum principles of respect and inclusion are be inclusive, strive to ensure that all feel welcomed and valued. This applies to our speakers and guests as well as for our student participants. Be open, consider ideas that challenge your beliefs. If we support and learn from one another in this diverse group, we each become stronger. Listen honestly. The forum is a neutral and safe space for testing ideas and asking questions. Work to receive rather than react and act mindfully. Bring the values of respect, inclusiveness and humbleness into your actions as a climate activist. In the spirit of respect, inclusiveness and humbleness, the organizers of the Global University Climate Forum acknowledge that in many cases, today's society is built on a foundation of oppression, whether it's been through forced occupancy of land or through the subjugation of people, there currently exists deep and seemingly incurable injustices throughout the world. The organizers of the forum ask that all participants consider their role in advancing a new future and putting us on a pathway to right these wrongs. It is my honor to introduce our speaker, Professor Dave Ray. Dave is a world leading expert and educator on climate change. Dave is chair in carbon management and education at the University of Edinburgh, executive director of the Edinburgh Center for Carbon Innovation, ECCI. He was assistant principal until 2017. He's an advisor to the Scottish government. In addition to all these formal roles, Dave is an inspiration to students, to staff, to alumni, at the University of Edinburgh and beyond. Dave does not just talk climate change, but walks the walk and puts his expertise into practice. He is widely published in journals and has written several books. One of these books is Climate Change Begins at Home, uh, which is also the title of today's presentation. Dave is going to do a presentation and then we've got lots of time for a Q&A. Please add any questions um, that come up through the chat and we'll work to pick those up uh, in the questions and answers and discussion. Without further ado, I'll hand over to Dave. Welcome, Dave. Thanks so much, Michelle. And yeah, I, I should have come up with a better title for this um, in terms of uh, instead of an old book title. Uh, but Climate Change Begins at Home kind of summed up what I wanted to cover. And uh, hopefully we can, it will live up to that title. Uh, so what I'll try and do now as ever is go through the panic of sharing my screen to see if that works, uh, which is always yeah it looks like it's working great so hopefully you can see that and some familiar or at least one familiar face um yeah so the the topic today that we're going to discuss is climate change begins at home and i suppose it's one of those things which um i guess often comes up is how much if we know about climate change and we want action to take place do we have any say in it do we have any power? Do we have any leverage? Um, and it's it's quite a, I guess, a, a more and more common thing is, is people um, feeling like they want some something radical to happen, uh, but don't know how to do that or don't feel like they've got the power to do that. So I, that's what we're going to talk about. And I use these two pictures, which um, I'll talk more about the person on the left, Emily, than the person on the right, but you'll be familiar with him. Um, but really, it's just to exemplify um, that individuals, this all comes down to individuals in terms of who we are. We are the biggest uncertainty in terms of the future climate of our planet, in terms of the decisions we've made in the past, but more importantly, the, the decisions we make now and into the future. And um, probably as one of the, one of the take homes from uh, this session is gonna be all of you feeling more pressure on you as individuals in terms of what you can do. Uh, so hopefully we'll get there and we'll get into lots of discussion around that too. 
So my first um, proper slide is, is kind of a horrible one, but it's, um, it's in here because it gives so much information and it's a shout out to um, ourworldindata.org. So they are a brilliant uh, organization that do data on everything, mainly on COVID at the moment, but loads of great information on climate and greenhouse gases. So do check them out when you get a chance. Uh, but this is where all the greenhouse gas emissions in the world come from. So this is global greenhouse gas emissions, as it says. And you can see um, there's a lot of detail on here, but the take homes really are that most of our greenhouse gas emissions globally are in some way related to our energy use. So we've got energy use in industry, in transport, in buildings, um, and all of those things actually have a link back to our, us as individuals and our choices. So if we think about energy use in industry, obviously a lot of that is energy used to make stuff that we then consume. For transport, it's moving us around Obviously, energy use in buildings, a lot of that's either uh, heat or electricity for, um, for making it comfortable for us uh, in terms of the buildings we use. So I'll talk a fair bit about energy here uh, and reflect on how we've got skin in the game. We can do things, but also um, there are significant barriers as well that we uh, have to address as individuals and communities. Um, I'll talk a bit about the green triangle there, the green wedge, which is agriculture uh, dominated so agriculture, forestry and land use. So this is our food. So obviously that's um, a key choice for many of us is our diet uh, and food plays, a, as you can see, a, a major part in terms of driving climate change, but also it's going to be a key focus, has to be a key focus in terms of how we limit um, uh, uh, climate change uh, as well as adapting to the impacts. And the final two there, we can see waste, the yellow, the blue wedge, sorry. Uh, so things like landfills uh, and waste streams, obviously all of us, again, have a role to play in that. So you can see my climate change begins at home titles, not that far off. And you would think, okay, cement and chemicals, where is that climate change begins at home? But cement obviously is a key part of construction. It's a major source of carbon dioxide globally. Uh, again, we have choices in terms of the materials that we use, um, the reuse of products. Uh, so we'll get onto all of these in one way or another in terms of the segment. But the way I, re oh yeah, so before I get onto the next slide, the way I wanted to um, also break this up is with a couple of polls. So the first poll we've got, I thought I'd put in early. So we saw where all those greenhouse gas emissions come from globally. Uh, so what I want all of you to then consider is, right, that's a lot of greenhouse gas, carbon dioxide, methane, and the rest. Um, who is responsible for it? So as you can see, the question is, what percentage of global emissions do the richest 10% of people emit? Is it 10%, so you know, one for one, 30%, uh, or is it actually over 50%? Uh, and apparently I'm not allowed to vote. I do know the answer to this one. So uh, do put your, your answers in there and hopefully we'll see, see what you all think. This is where I can't get rid of the poll myself now. So I guess we'll come back to the results. I can't see the results of the poll, so we'll come back to, to that and the other one we're going to do in a bit uh, at the end. Um, but really, that's just uh, to highlight the fact that, oh, there are the results. Brilliant. Oh, Scott's on the, on the ball here. So we've got uh, an overwhelming majority of you went for over 50% as your answer in terms of uh, what percentage of global emissions the richest 10% of people emit. Um, some of you went to 30%, it's actually the over 50%. And this is one of the big, I guess, one of the major issues with climate change that, that all of you will be aware of is it's complex to tackle because the emissions come from so many different sources like we saw on the first slide, but it's also a real issue of inequity in terms of most of those emissions coming from the developed world and from the uh, richest, richest sectors of society. So uh, in terms of how we tackle climate change, how we limit emissions, that has to take that into account in terms of um, this transition to net zero that all nations have to make during this century, that being a just transition, that taking account of these disparities in terms of responsibility, but also ability uh, to act, uh, something which is in, enshrined in the Paris Agreement, which uh, 
obviously we'll, we'll I'm sure we'll get on to in the Q&A. Fantastic. Thanks for making that work, Scott, because uh, I know it's, uh, it's one of those things that I would have just, I would have shut down my computer if I had tried it. So, I wanted to talk about that big red segment where our energy comes from. And with the examples I'm going to give, I'm going to hopefully get a chance to talk a bit about some heroes of mine as individuals who are relevant to this in terms of individual action. So in terms of our energy, we're seeing this huge, um, I guess, revolution going on around the world in terms of um, a transition away from fossil fuels like coal. Um, some of that transition is towards natural gas, but a lot of it is towards renewables. As individuals, obviously, um, we can have some say in terms of growing for green tariffs and those kind of things if they're available. I guess where we're seeing it more proactively is through um, adoption of microgeneration. So things like the solar panels on that house at the bottom, um, actually producing our own energy, uh, which means we don't have to be connected to the grid in some circumstances. And so we can actually contribute on a sunny day back into the grid with low or zero carbon energy. My hero for this one though is Katrin. So Katrin Puetz works mainly in, uh, in Ethiopia. And um, I've got her in here because she is just, she's an exemplar of just some superb thinking. So she, she works in these villages and very much aware, not just of the, the carbon footprint of energy uh, in terms of using diesel generators or, uh, or uh, fossil fuel gas, um, but also a lot of people not having access to those energy sources, the prices being high. And one of the things she works with a lot are farmers, farmers who have cattle and they have a lot of manure. And what Catherine was very aware of was that if you rot that manure down, you can collect the gas that's emitted, which is methane, but biogenic, so biological methane, um, and that could be a great energy source. One of the main limitations, though, is collecting that methane and then getting it to the places it's going to be used. So what Catherine came up with was the blue bags. You can see her and a colleague with the blue bags there. And um, these allow you to collect the methane from the farms and take it into where it's going to be used, maybe a school kitchen for cooking the school uh, lunches. Um, it makes the, the energy source, this waste to energy source, um, mobile. And so that great kind of um, just thought about how could we do this and make it mobile and, and kind of low cost. Um, it's a way which I guess increases energy security, makes use of this waste product, um, but also uh, avoids using fossil fuels. So a great way of mitigating uh, the emissions. The next area I want to talk about is travel because that came up as part of our big red segment there. Again, in terms of um, it's starting at home. So a lot of us do have choices about how we travel and a lot of travel options at the moment are high carbon. Uh, obviously there are things like active travel, walking and cycling, which are good for us. A lot of us have had to do that um, as part of COVID restrictions anyway. Um, but again, a key thing here is yes, we, want, we need to do it and it's, it's something a lot of us are doing, but it's not all climate change begins at home with that because it needs to be safe. It needs to be something which is facilitated by our cities, by our local government and our national government. So with all of these, it's kind of, it's never one or the other. It's never uh, Trump or Emily, like on the first slide, in terms of one individual wanting to do something and then one uh, president stopping them or doing something else, actually it's got to be an integration of those levels. And uh, that's where we see all the, the biggest successes. You can't kind of, we can't move forward unless, um, unless we have that uh, across the board. The bus there in the middle is something that um, certainly here in Scotland, we're advised not to do at the moment. So we've had this big shift to the car uh, which is a real shame because public transport obviously can help us cut emissions. But one of the other ways uh, for our buses uh, and our trains and other public transport um, to cut emissions when we can use them again is to look at alternative fuels. So that bus is using hydrogen uh, as a fuel source instead of diesel uh, to reduce not just the emissions um, that cause climate change, but also to improve the air quality. Uh, and the final um, picture at the bottom is electric car. So that's the, the big hope certainly for us in the UK is most of our private cars, if we're using a lot of them still, uh, that they will be electric and that electricity will combine with much more uh, renewable electricity, particularly from wind power here in Scotland, uh, to mean that we decarbonize our transport sector. And my hero for this one is a, is a really odd one. You're thinking Tim Berners-Lee, why has he got him? Uh, so Tim Berners-Lee obviously, 
the inventor of the internet. Um, and he's on here because without him, we wouldn't be able to have this event. You know, it would be great to all be together. Um, it'd be great to have you all here in Scotland so you can enjoy our fantastic weather for a start. But he's allowing us, uh, and he has allowed us for a long time now, to travel uh, virtually. And so I guess it's allowing a lot of um, emissions to be avoided at the moment in terms of travel, but actually for a lot of our, our university for work, for instance, work, for instance uh, traditionally we fly an awful lot. Aviation's uh, fastest growing, or was the fastest growing sector in terms of emissions. Um, Tim Berners-Lee's invention, the internet, actually allows us through platforms like this um, to not have to do that, to actually um, still have really productive meetings, uh, be more efficient actually, spend better, more time with family and friends as well. Um, and so that's why Tim is in there as a hero for transport. The next one I want to mention is how we live and what we buy. And this is probably where it's kind of obvious uh, that climate change begins at home because this, this often relates to our homes and the decisions we make in it. So it can vary from things like, uh, we've got at the top left there, um, an example of home cooking. Um, and uh, for many areas in the world, um, obviously the, the cook stoves are a major um, uh, element in terms of they need a lot of fuel. And actually just improving the efficiency of cook stoves, going from something like a three stone cook stove to something which burns wood or charcoal more efficiently can be a way to, to reduce deforestation, so cut emissions, but again have that benefit in terms of improved air quality as well. So, you know, a lot of it, um, a lot of the solutions do come, come back to our home, but again, it's having access to that technology, even if it's something like a clean cook stove is vital. The next picture in the middle there, you'll recognize as an iPhone. This could be any phone or anything, but it represents the fact that everything we buy, everything we consume has a carbon footprint. And so the longer we make that iPhone last before we get the new one, uh, that spreads out its carbon footprint. More importantly, I guess, for all of the stuff we consume is looking at, um, for many of us, including me, reducing consumption but also looking at the, the kind of circular economy, this idea that we, it isn't sustainable to carry on using raw materials, virgin materials to make our iPhones and everything else. We need to reuse those materials and actually have a circular process. So when that comes to the end of its life, is there a good fix it shop that can get it going again and, and, and give it, extend its lifetime? But when it is unusable, can all of those precious elements be extracted from it and reused? So they're reducing the, the exploitation of the natural environment, those natural resources, but also reducing that carbon footprint. So the circular economy principle is, is kind of fundamental to addressing climate change, in my view. Uh, the final picture on the bottom left is dear to my heart because it's coming into winter here in Scotland. And so it's starting to get cold and dreek, as we say. And so the heating is going on. And so a key thing for us, I guess, um, in terms of climate change beginning at home is our energy use in home, how, how, we, how many jumpers we put on when it gets cold, um, but also how well insulated our houses are, what's the building standard that they're built to. So again, a real role for government there. Um, but part of that is also uh, working with us as the, the householders, the people who live in the houses in terms of making them um, low energy, more efficient, lower carbon. And my hero for this one is Alfredo. So Alfredo is, uh, as it says here, based in Brazil. Uh, he works a lot with communities who live in essentially um, shanty um, towns. So where there are no windows, there's no um, mains electricity for lighting. And I guess Alfredo is a hero because he came up with this idea of how to light these spaces without electricity um, and without any money. So he found a waste source, which is, as you can see, a plastic bottle. And he makes these bottle lights, which basically um, allow um, light to enter these areas um, that normally you would need a generator, uh, so diesel, to run if you, if you could afford it. Um, he allows light into there. So basically, it's a really simple design with a bit of bleach in the water um, to stop algae growing in it. And it's letting the sun in through a, a refraction uh, lens um, that goes through the roof. So a lovely um, kind of example of of kind of knowing the need a bit, a bit like Katrin and knowing, you know, technology is great. We can come up with some great solutions, but sometimes the simplest solutions like using a plastic bottle uh, can be even more effective um, in terms of solving issues. 
So Alfredo's in there for that. Okay, I'm going to mention this one uh, because it's really dear to my heart. And you might have seen the news about McDonald's today uh, going over. Well, they certainly have mainstreaming a plant-based burger. What we eat is a, is a, a major um, determinant of our emissions. It's, it's definitely an example of climate change beginning at home. We know that things, uh, so red meat and dairy are big emitters of greenhouse gases through the methane that's belched by um, cattle and sheep. And so looking at uh, more plant-rich diets, often there are, there are health benefits as well. In the developed world, on average, we eat too much red meat. So um, there's a win-win there in terms of reduced emissions and improved health. I guess across the food system, it's such a major part of our emissions. So if we add it all up, including the transport, et cetera, it's about a quarter of global emissions are uh, due to the uh, global food system. And so that's a huge amount. We can vary that in terms of diet. One of the most important ones, I guess, that we still aren't exploiting enough is avoiding food waste. So about a third of all that food we never get to eat. It's lost in the fields to things like those maize weevils in the middle. Um, but for um, a lot of us, certainly here in Scotland, uh, most of that wastage happens at the consumer phase. It's the back of our refrigerators with that kind of rotting lettuce or whatever it is. And so that's an opportunity where if we can reduce that food waste, it sends a ripple right back to the farms in terms of reducing emissions. We don't have to grow the food twice, right? So it's, it's a really powerful way of improving food security in many cases uh, and also cutting emissions. And so my hero here is Emily, who I mentioned right at the top. Emily Cummings, um, she works mainly in Namibia uh, and she was working with villages there, mainly on food security issues. Uh, where there was plenty of food, but there's a real issue in terms of not having uh, mains electricity and not having refrigerators. So food was going off fast. And Emily's story is that uh, from the age of four, she was working in that workshop you can see behind her, which was her grandfather's. Apparently she drove him round the twist in terms of uh, stealing his tools and making things. But then when she was out in Namibia, she saw this issue in terms of uh, needing a, um, some way of keeping food uh, for longer. So she came up with this, uh, what is a solar fridge. So a liquid goes into the outside layer, the sun shines on it, and through evaporation, it cools the food inside. So it reduces food waste and loss, uh, has an environmental benefit through that, but also helps in terms of food security. If you can hear noise in the background, that's just my window cleaner, don't worry. <laughs> so that gets us on to poll two, um, which is, and I, I'm guessing most of you uh, will go straight to this, uh, but it's two big topics. So what has the biggest uh, climate impact? Is it going vegetation, uh, not vegetation, going vegetarian or recycling your plastic? So obviously we've had a lot of coverage of both of these, of vegetarianism um, and plant-based foods uh, and their, their benefits and issues. We've also had a huge amount of coverage of plastics in the last couple of years in terms of, you know, the massive issue they pose for ecosystems and plastic waste. So, um, yeah, which has the biggest climate uh, impact and benefit? That's the question. So I'll give you a second to, to have a think and vote. In the meantime, my window cleaner's finished, which is good. We'll see if the results come up here. I've got a sneaking um, suspicion I know what the answer is going to be. Yeah, yeah, okay. So um, it's about three to one in terms of the vote. Uh, so most of you think going vegetarian um, has a bigger impact in terms of reducing greenhouse gas emissions compared, compared to recycling your plastic. And that's right. So both are really important. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, recycling plastic, it's, it's, it's particularly important in terms of that, that waste issue in terms of uh, the oceans and blocking drains. Um, it does have an emissions benefit, but it's dwarfed by the impact of going vegetarian. If you're um, certainly if you're a big meat eater, it's a, it's a key way to, to cut emissions, even just reducing. Uh, red meat intake can reduce your emissions quite radically. So uh, yeah, most of you got that. I knew you were made, I made these too easy. I knew, I knew. Okay, right. So uh, the next, I think the final um, area I wanted to talk about um, before we go on to kind of take homes is how we use our land and seeds. And again, 
This is a huge part of our emissions, as we saw with that big green triangle, um, changing land use, often uh, forest clearance for agriculture, emissions from the soils as well as the lost uh, trees. That's a, that's a major impact in terms of adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere. And it kind of links back to our dietary choices, where we source our food from, um, and the choices we make there. For the oceans, um, they are a major carbon stock. Uh, so they play a huge role in terms of the cycling of carbon between the atmosphere and the land and the oceans. Uh, again, a major question for them and blue carbon is, um, is how do we protect them better? How do we protect forests on the land better and the soils? How do we protect uh, blue carbon better? And some of the most su successful examples of improved protection have been through individuals and communities leading the way. So understanding the value of these places often not just for the carbon benefits but uh, all the biodiversity benefits but for their cultural values for their, um, their, their kind of aesthetic uh, importance uh, within communities so, so there's a you know a key role there I guess for individuals in terms as I'm going to get on to in terms of what we say about what we want to happen uh, the final picture there in terms of planting a tree is another example uh, I guess that all of us as individuals hopefully have done and if you haven't done that yet do it because it's just the best thing to plant a tree and then you go back um, sometimes you know every year but if you go back five years ten years later and there's this thing you can sit under when it's too hot and gives you shelter when it's raining and you were part of that tree um, you know, growing is, is, is just a, a joy anyway my my hero for this is Lillian so Lillian Wangombi, as you can see uh, on the right there, is from Kenya. And she is someone who, she's a maize farmer, um, so a small holder. She's an example of someone who, um, who practices push-pull agriculture. So when Lillian plant, plants her maize crop, she plants around it um, a crop of long grasses. Uh, and the long grasses, they, um, they're crucial because they pull away the pests of the maize. So the maize is attacked often uh, in, in areas of Kenya by this thing called stem borer. And so the, it, it's pulled away by the grasses. So that's the pull part of push pull. She also plants a, a, a small plant called desmodium. So this is a low growing plant that she plants around the base of her maize plants. And that gives off a smell that the stem borers hate. So that's the push, so the push pull agriculture. What Desmodium also does is it does this magic of fixing nitrogen from the air, so a bit like peas and beans. And that means Lillian doesn't need to use nitrogen fertilizer to still get a high yield from her maize. Uh, nitrogen fertilizers are a significant source of greenhouse gases, so her system is low carbon. It's a real you know, uh, productive system. It's um, resilient as well in terms of pest attack. So she's kind of essentially, she's one of the front runners in terms of climate smart agriculture and linking both cutting emissions, mitigation, and being resilient to climate change and pest attack, uh, so adaptation uh, together. So she's an example, another hero, um, of an individual just kind of looking at an integrated system and thinking about um, how, how you can use a diverse um, set of crops uh, and plants to make yourself climate smarter. Right. So. I'm going to finish there with a bit of what next. So these are things hopefully we'll get to discuss in a minute in a bit more detail. But the, the major thing you've all done, you've already ticked number one, I guess, which is learning more. Um, so there are great resources like Carbon Brief, Our World in Data, I've mentioned, um, the stuff you do uh, professionally, I guess, in terms of your studies, uh, but events like this as well in terms of learning more about climate change, about your role in it, what you can do. I guess the do more one, we've covered some of that in terms of travel, diet, energy, shopping. The most important one is thinking because, and this is where the pressure comes on to all of you guys, is those heroes that were in there, and they're just my personal heroes in terms of some of these topics. Um, that's kind of, that's the role for all of you is as individuals to, to understand this, to think about how it relates to what you wanna do, what you want to achieve, uh, and actually helping to deliver those kind of solutions. Um, you could be um, the president of the US and obviously you could, um, you could have some real big impact. Uh, you could be Emily and have huge impact too. Um, and so that thinking about, yeah, what you want to happen and how you can make it happen, that's probably the most important 
action. And as part of that, the final one is, is just saying more. It's talking to uh, friends and family about, um, about what we can do uh, as individuals um, to, to cut out missions and, and, and the decisions we're making. Um, it's talking to your college and your employer uh, about what they're doing. And actually, if you think they're not doing enough, then demanding more action. And that applies to your town and to your government. One of the things we've seen in, as climate scientists in the last 10 years um, has been just a revolution in terms of not just understanding of climate change uh, across the world um, and in civil society, but actually a demand for more action. And what that's done is supported governments to do more. It supported businesses to change their practice. Who knew McDonald's would mainstream a plant-based burger? I just never thought the day would come. It is, it's come, it's come today. So saying more is, is absolutely crucial to this. So yeah, no pressure, but I can't wait to hear uh, what you're all gonna say. Thank you. Dave, thank you so much. Very inspiring presentation. And I think we're starting to get some questions coming through. Um, you a bit touched on it there, but sometimes the challenges can feel so big for any individual to have action. And a question, first question for you, just to kick off our discussion. If you focus on the individual, does this not let governments and businesses who may have quite big levers and opportunities to have a huge and systemic impact, does that let them off the hook? And could you share any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's such a great question. And it, you kind of think it would. And there's been a lot of this is this comes up a lot in debates on Twitter. So on Twitter, a lot of people say, oh, it's all about the system change um, and not about the individual. And it, and it lets them off the hook. So exactly that argument. But actually, in um, not just in my experience, in, in terms of experience of, of the literature as well, when we look at this, the more individuals act, the more they find barriers that that system is putting in the way. And so they demand change. So if you don't have the individuals on board, then you don't get that push for change. You also don't get the, the kind of, if you're relying on government to do it, then we as individuals um, will then hold them back. So some governments want to go really fast. And some of the changes that we need to reach net zero are going to affect our lives. You know, it's going to maybe uh, constrain us in terms of how often we fly, or certainly we might have to pay extra, for instance, is one of the suggestions uh, here in the UK. If we don't, if we aren't on board with that, with individuals, if we haven't thought about it and actually we aren't pushing for this or supporting it, then those, those policies will never come through because the governments will be too scared to go ahead with them. We've seen signs of this with Macron in France, for instance, in terms of uh, fuel duties. So it needs to be both. Uh, and it's, I don't think it's, it's actually less letting them off the hook and more, the more we as individuals engage with this, the more pressure actually it puts on them. Um, so yeah, that would be my answer. Brilliant, thanks Dave. I'm looking at some of the questions coming up in the Q&A and just a uh, note for everyone to please do add your questions and you can vote on them. Um, the first question I want to pass over to you is from Tamara, um, who talks about the balances between food safety um, and um, climate related impacts. Um, noting a principal problem around the way that we consume our food is that we want to have the assurance that our food is safe. Could you share any thoughts on potentially any trade-offs there? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I love that question because it's an area that my research kind of looks at a bit, just in terms of wherever you look with climate change, things cross over. And food's a really good example where food itself, in terms of warmer temperatures, uh, spoilage rates, things um, actually becoming dangerous for our health in warmer um, uh, climates, that actually can, can pose a risk to us. And so that's where the win-wins can come in, in terms of better storage and, and, and avoiding food waste. One of, the, one of the key areas in that is um, foodborne toxins and foodborne disease. So uh, maize that I talked about um, just earlier, that can carry um, a horrible toxin called aflatoxin, um, which is at the moment a real public health disaster, actually, in, uh, in many countries. And one of the issues there is that You've got, you've got a changing climate, which is making it harder to keep control of. You've also got a situation where the, the science, I guess, the agronomy, the way um, crops are grown, the information the growers have 
is, is different. There's an inequity. So if you're in Europe, aflatoxin, all the grains tested uh, to, to within an inch of its life, and we all as farmers have loads of information we can go to, um, and we are basically the market rewards us for producing aflatoxin-free grain. If I'm in Malawi, then I'm in a situation more commonly where the market is just, you know, not fit for purpose in terms of avoiding aflatoxin. I've got times of year when even if I know it might have aflatoxin, I'm going to eat it because I haven't got anything else. So those inequity issues in terms of foodborne disease and climate change exacerbating those, uh, that's, that's one of the, that's part of the, the kind of the nexus of these things coming together. And so it's something that we at Edinburgh, so Erica, who you know, um, one of my colleagues, she's working specifically on this at, when we're looking at addressing climate change, particularly from the perspective of agriculture, how can we build capacity? How can we share good practice, but actually instead of just saying, okay, the market's shut to you because your production methods are risky for aflatoxin, actually, can you help those smallholders um, increase productivity and avoid the aflatoxin risk? So, uh, sorry, I talked too much about that one, but it's, uh, it's a topic dear to my heart. No, it's fascinating. And that actually links to another question, which has been coming up in the chat, is maybe could you say a little bit more on the um, direct um, impacts due to meat consumption? A question coming up, which has about seven people agreeing with it, is how is eating meat contributing to climate change? And could you talk a bit more about specific procedures for that? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'll signpost our world and data again, because Hannah, another colleague who runs that, um, has done a great breakdown of where the emissions come from, from livestock agriculture. Uh, but for ruminant agriculture, which is the main source of emissions, most of it is methane that the ruminants belch, uh, just as part of their digestion. Um, and that's a powerful greenhouse gas. Um, you've got another component, which is uh, from nitrous oxide. So that's the nitrogen in their manure. Um, which uh, is another powerful greenhouse gas, uh, but also the nitrogen that's used to grow their, their feed. So a lot of ruminants around the world don't just eat grass, they obviously eat feed which is grown for them and that has a big climate penalty when it's being grown, if it's soy or something else. Um, probably the, I don't know if it's the, the least known or most well-known part of it is land use change for ruminant agriculture, <coughs> excuse me. So that picture I had of, um, deforestation that was deforestation in brazil and that was taking uh, place um so clearance of the forest for beef agriculture for growing um uh, beef so having cattle on those areas so that's another key part of our i guess um meat carbon footprint is land use change uh, certainly in terms of the global average is loss of forest loss of soils for grazing uh, lands for ruminants. So you put all those together, it's a big carbon footprint. <coughs> Excuse me. Brilliant. Thanks, Dave. Another question that's come up, and I know this is dear to your heart too, on the sort of how we <laughs> communicate all of these issues. And a question has come up around how do you how do you encourage other people to take actions and, and really spread this word? People tend to think that climate change isn't their responsibility. So if you were to give top tips to um, all the students here today, how do you how do you promote and encourage action? Yeah, so it's it's kind of well, you all know the best answer to that because you know your friends and your family and your networks in terms of what makes them tick. If it's um, if it's stuff in terms of sharing stuff on social media, is it a group within your college that you want to kind of get going or be part of or take a role in? Um, I've, my, my closest example for me is my village. I live in a small village in the countryside in Scotland. And we, everyone knows I'm a climate scientist. And so they always ask me about the weather, which I have no idea about because they're different things, but that's what, but they all say what we all do is take note of what everyone else is doing. And so we were the first in the street to get solar panels. And this is, you know, inevitable, I guess, with any new bit of kit in the street is everyone came around to that. Everyone wanted to know how much it costs and does it work? And suddenly, um, so it took a while. I guess people were a bit skeptical. And then one of the neighbors at the far end of the street went, oh, yeah, I'm going to get them too. And then it's gradually grown. The same with electric cars. So we were the first one to get an electric car. Um, and everyone was a bit skeptical about that. And then a few friends uh, in the street had a test drive and then they got them too. And so part of, 
I guess how we function as humans is we have our our social norms, but they are dynamic. They change based on what we're picking up, the messaging from other people. So part of what you can do, I suppose, is be be the exemplar of, of who you want to be and people will follow you. And I suppose uh, part of that is, like I say, knowing your audience, that communication classic. We all know our audiences better than anyone else, whether it's our family, people at work, people at college. Uh, and so thinking about what actually is the best way to communicate to them um, the benefits of this because for most of it so it'd be no good if I said to all my neighbors oh yeah it's really good having an uh, electric car but it cost me you know uh, double your salary uh, to buy it you know they would just kind of um, say well that's no good but actually I was in, in my example that's what they all thought and I said oh I got it second hand and it was cheaper than your car you just got which it was a petrol one for my immediate neighbor and so it's that it's kind of knowing um, I suppose the, the reality of it, being able to talk to that, but also, like I say, know, know your audience. Brilliant, thanks Dave. Um, another question is uh, picking up on um, something you touched on in the presentation was about travel. I know definitely for my own carbon footprint, um, travel always comes up. I live in Scotland, I've got family um, in Canada who I love and still want to see them and I hang my head in shame because of the um, carbon that that involves. And we're here today with an international you know, group of students as well, um, as well as representing universities uh, which are international. Um, and as universities, people move, people travel, um, students and staff. Um, thoughts from your perspective about how universities can marry the kind of international agendas and aspirations in the context of the climate emergency, also ensure that we achieve carbon uh, targets? Yeah, yeah, so, so I guess the biggest one for us as universities, uh, and this is all institutions, is, is measuring it in the first place. So we've looked at this for the University of Edinburgh um, and I guess Yale and the others will be looking at it too in terms of how much emissions come from our students having to fly because we are all international universities and so that's kind of on us you know the emissions you take to get to Edinburgh if you're coming here internationally that's on us in my view as a university um, so that is then our responsibility as a university to measure that but then to work out a way of um, either helping limit that so the way we structure our semesters um the the kind of the expectations in terms of going backs and forwards from home you know limiting those flights but they're always going to be some so while we've got significant aviation emissions it comes down i think to our organizations to cut our emissions radically but also look at sequestering emissions so one of the things a lot of our universities are thinking about is, okay, we're always gonna have this aviation block. What can we do as a group of, a un of universities to look at offsetting? So this sequestration of emissions and not just do that in a, we'll go online and find a uh, somewhere where you can just fill in a box with the amount of tons of CO2 and pay the bill, but actually involve our students in that, our researchers, make it, um, gold standard in terms of the emissions reduction, um, but actually make it part of our education and our, and our teaching, our role as a university. So I think that that's a really active um, conversation, but I think it's, it's a crucial one. With aviation, we will get there where it will be lo much lower carbon. So the fuels will change, um, you know, the, the kind of the, um, the efficiency of the flights has improved a lot. Um, but it's always going to be a part of us as international universities, even with Zoom and all of this, we still will want people moving around. Um, but we have to take responsibility for that ultimately. And so that is going to come down to some, some real action on the ground, literally in terms of planting trees, I suspect. That's very helpful. Thanks so much, um, Dave. But the other question um, raising, which links to some of the questions coming up in the chat, is in your presentation, you prompted us um, to think about the COP26 and its one year until the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, the 26th mm -hmm. conference of the parties. And I know that you're involved in discussions all around that as it takes place in Glasgow. 
um, next year. Could you share your thoughts on a vision for success for the COP, but also these big global events can seem inaccessible and a few questions have come up, people wanting to know what's the kind of one action they can do or the most important thing that they could do. Could you think about your sort of big vision, but also share what's the most important action that you'd want to see? Yeah, um, Carl, there's, there's a lot there. So I am so excited about COP26. Uh, obviously it's gonna be in Glasgow next November. Um, it, was it was building up to be something quite special anyway with the the result in the us um it's taken on a whole new dimension in terms of the hope for cop 26 was always for all nations in the run-up to it to make bigger commitments on climate change to up their ambition um bring their emission reductions in line with the paris climate goals uh, so get us on track for limiting warming to one and a half degrees and to be honest this time last year none of us thought that was really tenable uh if you ask us today most of us will say we've got a shot at this we really have because the coalition of nations committing to net zero by 2050 so the developed world nations like the uk have to do that they have to reach net zero so if they're emitting any from aviation they're sequestering the equivalent um, they've got to do that by 2050 at the latest um, for the developing nations, they'll need net zero targets too in the second half of the uh, century. And that seemed a long way off a year ago. Uh, but now we've got Japan, Korea, the EU and the US, uh, the president-elect committing to it as well. Um, actually, yeah, like I say, we've got a shot. So I'm really I'm massively excited about COP26. I think it's going to be the biggest COP since Paris. And I think it's not going to be a new agreement because we have the Paris Agreement. But what the success of COP26 was always about was this increased ambition from nations and not just committing for the next 10 years, which, which they all will be doing, but actually saying this is in line with that 2050 net zero target for developed nations. So, so yeah, very, very, very thinking very positively about that. For all of us, I guess, in terms of engagement, we don't know if COP's going to be affected by COVID or not even if it isn't and we've got lots of people coming here to scotland and do come if you can we'll work out some way of sequestering it even if it's on my farm behind you i'm going to plant loads of trees on there so we so you can all be here carbon free but attend the cop because it all it always runs virtually as well so you can go to the sessions you can be in debates there are um, a huge number of ways to involve because cop itself is you have the central zone, the blue zone, uh, where the negotiators are. But actually, uh, there are thousands of people, different NGOs, different um, topics being discussed, which will be relevant to you. Every, every nation in the world um, is, is kind of represented, uh, but also all the different um, challenges that we face and the solutions. So be part of it um, online for those two weeks. I guess the biggest thing, though, with a year to go, is have a think about what as an individual instead of those nations making their bigger commitments and they're going to up the ante in terms of what they're going to do uh, on climate change but we're all part of those nations so as an individual think about your year ahead think about what what commitments you want to make what you can do it might be okay by cop 26 i will have a group in my college who are pressurizing the university to get to net zero and helping advise them in terms of how they do that and how they involve the students, how we can uh, involve teaching and research. You know, that would be a pretty amazing aim. Um, and COP26, talking about hooks earlier in terms of letting people off the hook, COP26 is a hook to hang this on. It's two weeks, an amazing two weeks, I hope, in Glasgow. But the action on climate change will ramp up before it um, but I think after it, it will be, yeah, even more powerful. And so, yeah, think about that year ahead and, and then act, do something. Dave, thank you um, so much. Those are inspiring words to begin to close with. I know that there's um, another session happening after this, so we're going to wind down. Um, before I give thanks to you and a huge thanks to all our participants who've taken the time to join today, are there any last words of, of, of hope, of optimism that you'd like to share with all of us on the call today? Yeah, I, can't, I, can't, I suppose I've, um, I've talked about COP26. I suppose the... this. Totally honestly, I've been working on climate change for uh, 20, over 25 years now. 
and um, since before COVID, I suppose the Greta Thunberg effect, um, that increased awareness. Um, the last year, even with COVID, I've been the most optimistic we can do this I've ever been in my professional career. And that's been, that's been wonderful to see because uh, I think for most of us as a climate science community, we were a bit despairing about saying the same thing, probably not getting the communication right. And then a, a teenage girl kind of showed us how to do it, you know, big time. Um, but it is amazing. Things are really moving. They need everyone to go with that because like I say, governments will fall back on the, you know, the, the kind of easiest way out if we let them. Um, but yeah, things have looked better than they have in a very long time. So yeah, happy days. <laughs> Dave, thank you so much for the inspiring presentation and really thoughtful comments. And thank you to all of our participants who have joined um, today with your thoughtful questions. I understand that there will be a recording um, of this available. So if you want to go back to it after. Um, and I wish you a good day wherever you're dialing in from. Thank you, everyone. Thanks everyone. Thanks Michelle.